The Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today as we have been together, worshiping you in spirit and truth, singing your praises, giving to your glory, honoring you with our presence. And Lord, now we ask that you would bless us with your word, that your Holy Spirit might not only open the lips of your servant to speak, but open the heart and mind of everyone listening, watching, and here, that the word of God might be a comfort and a solace to our soul, that Heavenly Father, it might encourage us to go on, and that it might give us courage and strength. I pray, my Father, that you might magnify yourself, glorify your Son, edify your people, and save the lost. We'll thank you for what you do and give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Fear is something we all experience at one time or another and to one degree or another. It's a common human malady from which the Christian is not exempt. I've heard some preaching about the spirit of fear, as if it were some boogeyman which we can capture and tie up and boot out the door. Some preachers are having a field day and making a lot of money binding this spirit and that spirit, as if we could gather up all these pesky little varmints and bind them and thereby give Christians and unbelievers a happy day. How nice it would be. But they forget this one thing, the spirit of man, the sinful nature. We don't need little bindable hobgoblins running around to make us fear. We can do that all by ourselves. Fear is a product not of some spiritual imp, but it is the product of our fallen nature. Just like the other sins that are listed, if you would turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. And look at verse 8. The Bible says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I want you to notice that fearful heads the list. Fearful is a head of abominable. Fearful is a head of murderers. Fearful is a head of whoremongers. Fearful is a head of sorcerers and idolaters. Now, I don't know if God wrote them in the order of offense to him, but I just find it interesting that he starts off with the fearful. Now, if some of these preachers were telling us the truth, Uh, All we would have to do then is bind the spirit of fear and the spirit of unbelief and bind that little spirit of abomination and bind the spirit of murder and bind the spirit of whoremongering and bind the spirit of sorcerers and bind the spirit of idolaters and bind the spirit of lying and would all be okay. That's like saying the devil made me do it, isn't it? Well, I'm not responsible because it was this Spirit of lying that made me lie. No, it wasn't a a spirit as an entity of lying that made you lie. It was your nature that made you lie. It was your sinful human inclination that caused you to lie. You are a liar by birth. You're a liar by conception. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. I submit to you tonight that the spirit of fear is not some invisible hooligan that makes you afraid. It is the unchecked, uncontrolled, sinful nature of the spirit of man. It's you. Fear is the, pre- fear is the present mankind gave himself in his rebellion against God. Isn't that interesting? Fear is the present that mankind gave himself in his rebellion against God. The immediate product of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden was fear. 
Man became afraid of God and God's judgment as a result of sin. And this is a prevailing disposition of terror and timidity, a slavish dread of God as judge and as, of men as adversaries. It is the shrinking of the soul that destroys all holy confidence towards God and deprives us of all resolution in doing what is right. That's fear. In our text, we are told that God has given in Christ to every believer a power of spirit and a power of love that does not exist outside of Christ. And this power of spirit and this power of love produces a sound mind. J. Brewster is quoted, Without the spirit of power, all is forsaken. Without the spirit of love, all is ferocious. Without the spirit of a sound mind, all is foolishness. The first is the acting hand, the second the feeling heart, and the last the directing head. I do not believe that these are specific spirit beings, but rather the spiritual power that is given by the Holy Spirit to those who know Christ as Savior. These are yours, dear Christian. These are yours, the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So let's observe a few things tonight about fear. Turn with me to please to Mark chapter 4 and verse 10. Fear, number one, fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. And he, that is Jesus, said unto them, that's the disciples, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Fear is the opposite of faith. When we exercise faith, we do not experience fear. Fear is a lack of confidence in God. Fear says, maybe it won't work out like Romans 8.28 says. Fear says, maybe God won't come through after all. But faith believes God and rests upon His promises. Faith recognizes God's attributes. Faith recognizes that God is all-powerful. That God is all-knowing. That God is everywhere present. And that God does not change and lives considering those attributes. In other words, I am not afraid because my God is all-powerful. My God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or think. My God is able to do great and mighty things which I know not. My God is able. Nothing's too hard for my God. Nothing's beyond His scope. Nothing's beyond His knowledge. Fear says maybe God doesn't know. Or doesn't see. Or doesn't care. Or maybe God has changed his mind. You see, fear will produce impotence in the child of God and bring about an inability to live a faithful, fruitful life due to a lack of faith. What do we have to fear when Jesus is in the boat? That's what he was trying to tell to his disciples. He's saying, why are you so fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? Why don't you, have, why don't you trust me? Why don't you have faith? I'm here. Storms and seas, waves and winds, we need not fear. Because Jesus is here. And Jesus is always in your boat. Didn't he promise that he would never leave thee nor forsake thee? Didn't he say, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world? He's always near, and he's always in control. If you remember, he was asleep in that boat, but even asleep, he was in control. We need not be afraid to step out in faith. We need not be afraid to dare something for God. 
or to go with him, trusting only in his word and without sight. Fear is the opposite of faith. The second thing we want to look at about fear, look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, again, look at verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So what has He given us? He's given us power, the spirit of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. The sinful human nature gives you fear, but God gives you power. Christians who fear for their provision and their protection and God's enabling will live powerless Christian lives. And they will cower from every opposition, every obstacle, and every opposing foe. Fear says, what will people think? People says, or, uh, fear says, you're going to fail. Fear says, you can't do this. Fear says, if you, if you do that, you'll be a laughing stock. Fear says, oh, you better be careful, you'll get the devil mad. Fear says, maybe you'll get so-and-so mad at you. Fear makes us afraid to speak up, stand out, or answer for God. Fear leaves the Christian powerless to answer the gainsayers, powerless to science, silence the mockers, and powerless to convince the unbelievers. Because we're afraid. But God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. The power of God is there. He has given it to us to be a witness. But our human fear makes us afraid to witness, doesn't it? Our human fear says, well, what will they do? What will they say? How will I answer? That's the fear of human nature. But God's given us the power to overcome that. Doesn't the scripture say we're overcomers in Christ? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that ye ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. God says there's a power working in us, and with that power, God can do exceedingly abundantly Above all that we ask or think, God can do exceeding abundantly above all that you ever thought you could do by yourself. He can make you so much more than you could ever be by yourself. He can give you the power to do and say and act and work and serve and minister far exceeding what you could ask or think. It's a power that's working in us. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God has deposited the power of His Spirit in the believer so that He can then do what He wants to do in that believer and through that believer. The power of the Holy Spirit is given so that we can do what God wills us to do and we can do what is God's good pleasure for Him to do with us. God never asks of us more than He enables us to do. He'll never ask you to do something He will not give you or has not already given you the power to accomplish. He knows what we're made of. He knoweth our frame, and He remembers we're but dust. He can't ask of us things that are exceeding and abundant unless He gives us the power working in us to accomplish the things that are exceeding and abundant. He would never ask us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature if He wasn't going to take us and go along with us. He wouldn't ask us to do it if he wasn't giving us the power to accomplish it. But fear robs us. 
Because fear is the opposite of power. Fear says, I can't do that. God says, yes, you can. Fear says, I can't go there. God says, yes, you can. Fear is the opposite of power. He wants to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. You see, God's given you more power than you need. But we have to use it. So fear is the opposite of faith. And fear is the opposite of power. Go with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, look at verse 27. Point number three is fear is the opposite of peace. John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I don't want to make your heart skip a beat. He said, I'm not just leaving some kind of peace. He said, I'm leaving you my peace. Nah, he's the prince of peace. And he's going to take of his peace. And he has given us his peace. He says, peace I, have, I leave with you, my peace. I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The sinful human nature gives you fear, but God gives you power. The sinful human nature gives you fear that robs you of peace, but Jesus gives you peace. God has left within us a peace. The Bible says that passeth all understanding. A peace that cannot be measured, a peace that cannot be quantified, qualified, a peace that cannot be understood. Why? Because it's his peace. He said, I'm not giving you peace like the world gives you peace. When does the world give you peace? When everything's hunky-dory. When everything's going right. How often is that? The world gives you peace if situations are Good. If circumstances are good. Jesus said, I'm giving you a peace far beyond anything the world can give you. He said, I'm giving you my peace. It's an abiding peace that calms our hearts, steals our nerves, quiets our minds, and assures us of his redeeming grace and overcoming power. It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that just goes, isn't that great? To so just, in the, you know, everything's whirling around and the waves are banging and everything, lightning's flashing and you can just go, and trust God. What a peace. Because we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Fear says, what if you're not saved? Fear says, what if you didn't mean it? Fear says, what if you didn't believe enough? Fear says, what if God didn't forgive you? That's fear. That's the, that's the human nature questioning. One of the ways you'll know well, if it's God speaking to your heart or the devil, the devil will always ask a question. God will always tell you a statement. You see, the devil likes to come around to Christians and say, are you really saved? Did you really mean it? Did you have enough faith? God will come and say, you're not saved. See, the Holy Spirit says you're not saved. He doesn't want you to question your salvation. He wants you to know you're not saved. The devil wants every Christian to question his or her salvation. Because as long as he can keep a fear in us uh, that maybe we're not saved, we're not going to be able to serve with the power and the peace and the faith that, he wants us to, that God wants us to serve with. 
This fear is a result of a lack of understanding and a lack of believing God's word. Listen, folks, all we really have in this world anyway is God's word. That's it. Everything else is up for grabs, isn't it? Everything else is come and go. Everything else will perish with the using. Everything else changes. But the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says that God has preserved his word unto every generation. God himself said, I change not. And the peace of Christ gives us the power and the faith because we believe the Word of God. And I've said this many times to the Lord as, as we're talking, and I'll just say, Lord, if you don't bless me, I'm not blessed. If you don't help me, I'm not helped. If you don't protect me, I'm not protected. If you don't provide for me, I'm not provided for. If you don't love me, I'm not loved. Because he's all I have in the end. And he's all you're going to have in the end. Oh, but I have this, and I have that, and I have this one, and I have that one. What do you think they're all going to be someday? They'll all be gone. But God abides forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. Nothing causes us to continue on after failure like the peace of God. Nothing will sustain us through tempest and torment like the peace of God. Nothing will enable us to sing in, in the jail like the Apostle Paul, like the peace of God. Nothing will be able us to stand before the Sanhedrin like the disciples and have courage like the peace of God. Nothing will get us through the fiery furnace like Daniel's friends, like the peace of God of God. Nothing will enable us to be dropped in a pit by our brothers but the peace of God. That's what will keep us. That's what will see us through. When, when bad gets to worse, the peace of God is there to sustain us. But the spirit of man in its carnal nature strains against the presence of the peace of God and yearns for control of the heart and mind in order to produce fear. What did Jesus say in our text? He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Did you catch that little word? The little word let? You can decide to, to let fear rule or you can decide to let the peace of God rule. That's your choice. So he said, let not your heart be troubled. I know, he says, your heart wants to be troubled, doesn't it? Your, your human mind and your human heart and your human spirit wants to be troubled. But don't let it be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. I know you want to be afraid. I know there's a temptation in your flesh to, to be afraid. But neither let it be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. And don't let your heart be afraid. Why? Because you have my peace available. Just turn to my peace. Turn from your fear to my peace. Let the peace of God, the Bible says, rule in your hearts, Colossians 3.15. There it is again. Let the peace of God rule rule in your heart. God's peace is there and it wants to rule. He wants you to have his peace. And he says, let me have your heart. Let me have your mind. Let me have it. And I'll give you peace. What peace? The peace of God. Whereas Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. This is a decision you make. Not some invading intruder, but a choice over which you already have the power. So fear is the opposite of peace. And then I want you to turn me to 1 John 4, 8. Fear is the opposite of love. Fear is the opposite of love. 1 John 4, 18. 
John, by inspiration of the Spirit, says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, it says there is this perfect love. That word perfect means a mature love. And he says if you're a Christian and you have fear, you, are, you, you have an immature love. You are immature. Because when we mature in the love of God, it drives away fear. When I know that God loves me and God cares about me, and God has nothing but my best interest at mind, fear is driven out. The love of God that he has shed abroad in our hearts will cast out fear. I think that this kind of preaching that ascribes conditions of the human heart and mind and sinful nature as being spirit beings causes havoc and has not only misled people, but has produced more fear in the heart of God's people. Oh, you've got to bind the spirit of this, and you've got to bind the spirit of that, and oh, that's because of this spirit, and that's because of that spirit. Now people are afraid of the spirits. I've known Christians who are always getting delivered from this spirit and that spirit time and time again living in fear of evil spirits. We we shouldn't do that. Because what does love do? What does mature love do? Cast out fear. We have received the love of God. When we understand the love of God and rest securely in it, we will be free from fear. Albert Barnes said this, Nothing will do more to inspire courage, to make a man fearless of danger, or ready to endure privation and persecution than love. A love of God for us, and a love of God by us. Look at verse 19. 1 John chapter 4. We love him... What? Because he first loved us. And so when I have, when I understand and I, I appreciate and I accept the love of God for me, now I am able to have a love of God from me to God. And so the love of God is coming to me and then the love of God is coming from me. But I can't love God only in the fact that he first loved me. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Now, we can, allow the, we can allow fear to control our hearts and mind and cause us to doubt God's love and impede our ability to experience mature love. Here's what fear says. God does not really love you. How could he? Look at you. Fear says, you're not worth loving. Fear says, you're filthy. You're no good. You might as well face it. God can't love you. Fear says, nobody loves you. But what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says, God loves you. Let the peace of God rule in your heart by believing the Word of God. And when you get that old lying spirit of your own human nature saying to you, God doesn't love you, you say, no, you're wrong. God does love me. You have his word on it. He even wrote it down and sealed it in a book for all eternity. God has carved his initials and your initials in a heart on the tree of life. Fear is the opposite of love. You know, we're called upon by God 
to take advantage of the gifts and resources He has made available to us. We're called upon by God to go forward in the Christian cause despite every obstacle. We are called by God to serve the Lord without distraction. We are called by God to oppose the error of men without having enmity for their persons. We are called by God to walk worthy in days of danger and perplexity. We are called of God to be strong and of a good courage. But fear will keep you back and hem you in and tie you down so that you're paralyzed and can't be what God wants you to be or accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. Listen, I've said this many times. God has bigger plans for your life than you do. God has better plans for your life than you do. But we have to let God, amen? We have to let the peace of God rule in our heart. We have to let not our heart be troubled. We have to let it neither be afraid. It's a matter of choice. Fear will keep you back. The fear... The spirit of fear is not a little green-eyed monster, but it's your own sinful nature over which God has given you the ability to win. Why should we fear when we have God? The Bible says if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can win? God's already won. Let's march on. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Christians, did you hear some of the things fear has been saying to you tonight? We could go on and on of all the questions fear asks us and all the doomsday things fear puts upon us. Did you see that fear is the opposite of the things of God? There is a fear over which you need the victory tonight. Why don't you believe God for it? Why don't you quit being afraid of it and trust God? Why don't you quit looking at it and look at Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith? Maybe there's someone in this room tonight that would say, Preacher, you know, there, there's a fear. There's something I've been afraid of and I feared. And you, you, you didn't mention it specifically, or maybe I did. But you say, I, I need victory over that fear. Tonight, would you lift your hand up and say, that's me. There's a fear that, thank you, I need, thank you. I need victory over it, thank you. And, and God, yes, and God has given me the, the power and the peace and the faith <clears throat> and the love to overcome. Maybe you need to come tonight and just get along with God and say, dear Lord, forgive me for letting that which I'm afraid of appear greater than you. Forgive me for listening to my sinful nature instead of listening to your word. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. Do you fear the judgment of God? You should if you've never been forgiven and you've never been saved. However, you need no longer fear death and fear the judgment of God if you'll let the Lord Jesus Christ be your Savior. If you'll trust Him and believe on Him tonight, perhaps tonight you need to come and be delivered from the wrath to come and experience the power of God in your life. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that your need tonight, to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? Say, preacher, that's me. I need to be saved. Would you lift your hand up? Just between you and me and the Lord, you're just saying, yes, I recognize a need in my life. I need to be saved. 
And I, I know that tonight. I just want you to pray for me anonymously. Anybody like that here tonight? Father, we thank you for the great gospel of salvation by grace through faith and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that God became a man in Christ, died for our sins upon the cross and shed his blood as the perfect payment and died and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures with the authority and power to forgive sins and to give the gift of eternal life to all that would come to him and believe on him for it. Father, if there's someone in this room or watching or listening that need to do that, I pray you'd put it upon their heart very strongly, a conviction, a knowledge of their need, and a desire to receive Christ even now. And Father, I pray for anyone in this room watching or listening who are Christians that have fears, and phobias, and things that kind of cause us to get sidetracked and paralyze us and cripple us and discourage us, I pray you'd enable them to come and get victory tonight. Not by binding some elusive spirit, but by recognizing the truth of the word of God and letting the peace of God rule. I pray you'd guide us and direct us in the invitation as only you can, and we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 666. My Jesus, I love thee. You'd never be able to say, Jesus, I love you, if God hadn't said to you, he loves you first. And so tonight as we sing 666, why don't you come and talk to the Lord? He's so wonderful. He's so great. He's so gracious and kind. He's so merciful. He's so generous. He's so powerful. He's so loving and caring. Why don't we talk to him more than we do? Why don't we trust Him more than we do? Why don't we wait on Him more than we do? You come as we sing number 666. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine for Thee. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. The Bible says the last fear is death. And Jesus has even given us the victory over that, hasn't he? He's taken the sting out of death for us. If he can conquer the greatest and last enemy, he can take care of all the ones in between. We just need to trust him. We're going to sing that next stanza. If you have questions about salvation, you come and see me. If you have, just want to come and talk to the Lord, feel free to do so on the second. I love thee because thou hast first stanza and uh, right after we sing that stanza I'll have Mark close in prayer and then we're going to prepare for the Lord's table and if you're here tonight and you're saved you're more than welcome to stay and participate in the Lord's table let's sing that last stanza together in mansions of glory and
Until we go home to be with you in glory, we are going to have this battle, this battle with our flesh. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil, but Father God, I think our worst enemy is ourselves. Lord, help us to heed what was preached tonight. We know what the Word of God says, and help us to trust in your promises, Father God. So when that spirit of fear comes upon us, Lord God, our flesh starts to doubt God, we would say, no, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust in the living God. Father God, for someone here watching or listening who has never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not about religion. It is about a relationship with the God of creation who loves you and died for you. We just want to thank you for communion that we're now going to have, Lord, that uh, the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father God, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.